Ah, yes, this is the town of Benbow on the mining planet of Montressor. But then, being born here, you know all that, don't you, Jim? It's not the most exciting place in the galaxy, but we all have to start somewhere. Hello and welcome to Disney's Treasure Planet on the PS1, which probably sounds a little weird, and I thought it was kind of weird too. This intro area is actually a really good introduction to the kind of collectibles we can expect. These treasure chests can be broken with our sword, and they contain gems, which we will use twice in the game and only twice. Over here is a golden gem, which is very different from normal gems. We can use golden gems to unlock a... Uh, Pirate Treasure, which is basically the collectible we need to advance from level to level. These film... things... unlock gallery items for us, so we're not going to be collecting those at all. The intro area to this game is a little um, misleading. Oh, by the way, these barrels we can only break with our laser pistol. You may think it's weird that the laser pistol uh, stops so suddenly when it's shot, but there's a reason for that we'll get into later. Anyway, um, as I was saying, this intro area incorrectly gives off the impression that this game is exploration focused. That yellow heart gave us an extra life, by the way. But the game isn't really exploration focused at all, the levels are pretty linear. And anytime you gotta explore, it's really obvious stuff. It's, uh, it's hard to miss anything in the game. The worlds aren't really worlds or anything. They're just really long pathways. In order to open this big gate, we gotta zap the switch, and these walkie-talkie looking things next to the crates and switch, those are tutorials, so we're gonna avoid those as much as we can. Because we don't need them, and I can explain the mechanics a lot faster. Now, um, there are a couple requirements we're gonna meet before we finish this level. We're gonna need at least 100 treasure, uh, sorry, at least 100 drabloons, which is the currency we're picking up right now, and at least three pirate treasures. Like I said, the pirate treasures are the main collectible. Think of them like stars if you want to, from Mario. Oh, Jim! My dad left me in charge of the scrapyard, and there's some ugly old birds stealing spare parts. Can you help me, please? Ethan, yeah, sure. So this game is technically a 3D platformer, um, I'm pretty sure that's what most people would call it at least, but it really feels more like a, a collection of minigames where you 3D platform to get to the minigames. Cause a lot of the pirate treasure, which is like the stars from Mario, is stuff you get from minigames, like this one. This little shooting gallery minigame. The cursor control's kind of weird, by the way. It moves perfectly diagonally and perfectly horizontally and vertically just fine. But any kind of swerving movement it has a lot of trouble with. The game is supposed to have analog support, but I'm not sure it really does anything. That big bird you just saw would have grabbed Ethan and taken him away, which is horrifying. So make sure you shoot the big bird also. This mission's pretty easy, all things considered, after you get used to the aiming controls. But um, the main idea here, besides just to shoot all the birds with spare parts, is that the gold cogs are, wor are worth more than the silver cogs, and the silver cogs are worth more than the brown ones. So you can prioritize your shots. As long as you shoot them all, though, you're good, so, um... Not really any need for strategizing. Hey, Jim! You did it! Thank you! Here, um, I wanted to have this. You know, for helping me. My dad told me that they help spacers get between planets. And if you collect enough, you might be able to explore cool new worlds. So as a licensed game, um, this game's pretty bad. It's just below average as a 3D platformer on the PS1, but for a licensed game it's pretty bad because it doesn't take its license or the setting of the license very seriously. And to be fair, that's a problem a lot of Disney games have. Where they, um, they clearly didn't care about portraying the source material very well in video game form. Treasure Planet's one of the worst, though. And I, I think Treasure Planet deserved a lot better than this game, because I think it's a really nice movie. 
but I wanted to share this game anyway because it's really weird that this game came out because um this came out two months after Super Mario Sunshine and the PS1 was well on its way to dying in America you know in 2000 people were already calling the death of the PlayStation 1 but this was 2002 and there were a lot of better platformers on the PS1 by this point a lot of better Disney platformers too like Toy Story 2. Actually, uh, most of the PS1 Disney 3D platformers were made by either Traveler's Tales or Argonaut Games, who are really good developers. I'm not gonna say the games they made are really good, but, um, they're competent, talented people. Over here is the new power-up. If we land on this green circle, we gain a long-range ability for our laser pistol. So we can enter first-person mode and shoot crates. This long range ability isn't ever used for anything super interesting, it's usually just to bust crates or flip switches. And you can only use it for a limited period of time. You can also only use it in first person mode, so it's a really, really limited mechanic. Which, uh, which is... Which brings me to something about this developer who made this game. That was a scroll, by the way. If we get six of them, we get another pirate treasure, but we don't need them. Anyway, um, about the developer who made this game... The developer of this game is Magenta Studios. And, um, we looked at another game on this channel before made by them called Invisimals, The Lost Kingdom. They actually made a couple more 3D platformers for Disney. They made Stuart Little 2 and 3. And they also made a weird Muppet 3D platformer on the PS1, but most of their 3D platformers shared the same problems. And that all the mechanics are incredibly limited and the worlds don't really feel like worlds. They don't feel coherent or, um, or sensible to traverse. They feel like Mario's surrealistic block platforming, but without the block platforms, and they use licenses, which is really disrespectful. If you're gonna, um, if you're gonna develop a licensed game, you need to make sure you respect the property and its materials. What is that boat doing over there? Floating around in a void. We're coming up here to get the treasure before jumping down, because otherwise we'll have to jump back up, back, back up later to get it. So it just saves time to get it now. As you saw, we used the enhanced laser pistol to push a switch that moved that crate over, so that way we could proceed. That's, um, I think there's one other time where we need to use the enhanced laser pistol to press a switch in the game, and that's it. All the other times the enhanced laser pistol is just used to shoot far away, um, faraway boxes that contain items and stuff. Now there's a tutorial up here that I can't avoid. And as much as I love Delbert, we're just gonna scroll through the text as quickly as possible. He keeps talking even after we close his text box though, which is kinda weird. He's just telling us that we can move certain objects that have an obvious trail. This is a really limited mechanic too, which continues Magenta Software's streak of including limited mechanics that have incredibly limited uses. I think we only need to push a, a box one more time in the game, a single more, a single time, and that's about it. And you never do any block pushing puzzles or anything. Nothing organic happens with the block pushing. You just always push boxes, boxes to jump up somewhere higher. That time Delbert was talking about how there was a power diode missing, which is basically just a key. There's um, a couple more places in the game where there are doors that are, have missing power diodes, so you can't just shoot a switch to open them. But the power diodes are already, uh, uh, sorry, are always super nearby, like always in the immediate vicinity, so you're never going to have any trouble finding them. You don't really got to explore in this game at all. That has to really hurt your hands, Jim. I really wouldn't do that. I guess to some people who don't like getting lost in 3D platformers, the incredibly limited level design in this game might be a relief, but um, it just feels kinda barren to me. You could, As soon as you walk into an area, you can pretty much tell exactly where everything is, which is a little weird. And like I said, it doesn't feel like an actual world. Like, it doesn't feel like I'm in an actual place right now doing stuff. It feels like this only exists for the purpose of um... Oh, I wanted to show you that the Enhanced Laser Pistol can't break this wall, but our regular Laser Pistol can. But like I was saying, it feels like this world exists solely for the purpose of me jumping in it. Sorry, kiddo! 
No one is to enter the mine unless they are a miner or an official union member. But if you really want to go in, I can probably let you into the union for 100 rubloons. Hmm? Here's the 100 rubloons for my union initiation fee. Welcome to the Interstellar Union of Miners. You will find that many doors are now open to you, including this one. So when I first played this game, I expected this miner thing to come into play later, because I was a little naive, but this is the last we hear of being a union member. Also, I played through this game four times, so I want you to remember that while you're watching me play it. I did this four times. The whole game, because I wanted to be good at it. Which wasn't necessary. Hello there, boyo! You look like you could use a lift! <laughs> it's also my job to operate the machinery for the main lift to the mine down below. Would you like to use it? You know, the lift. Yeah, sure, I'll use the lift. So this game, um, it has a really weird fascination with lifts. Every level in the game includes one. There are only four levels, by the way, but every level in the game has a lift in it, and it's, it's really weird. I'm, I'm not sure why. Maybe it's to disguise loading zones? Yeah, that's, that's probably it now that I think about it. That's probably what it's for. Anyway, we gotta come down here to shoot a switch which will open up the door. And this is basically as explorey as the game gets. You know, um, we're talking stuff in the same room kind of explorey. Nothing like, um, like Mario Odyssey or Tide the Tasmanian Tiger or Jack and Daxter. All the stuff you need is just kind of lying around. Um, even Toy Story 2, which was also on the PS1, had a lot more exploring in it. With really big environments that, that weren't, um... Here's another extra life. I mean, I'm not gonna say Toy Story 2 is a great game or anything, but there's, um... There's more to it than this, you know? This game's just, just almost, almost as simple as 3D platforming gets. That reminds me, I haven't mentioned one of the jumping mechanics yet, so I'll talk about that after this cutscene. And we grab this gold. The mine's been overrun by bandits, and they're trying to destroy the generators! If they succeed, we'll all be trapped down here. Can you help us? You got it! I'll help stop the bandits and defend those generators! So this one isn't really a minigame, but it is an introduction to the combat, which is also super limited, but it's trying to do something. So I'll give it that. So, um, do you remember Spyro? And how sometimes your flame hurt enemies, and sometimes your headbutt hurt enemies? And enemies were generally weak to one of those? Well, that's how the combat in Treasure Planet works. Um, there are some enemies that are weak to your laser blasts, and some that can't be hurt with your laser blasts, and some are weak to your knives, and some can't be hurt with your knives. And then there are some enemies that can be hurt by both. The guys with the guns, we can't hurt them with our gun, so we gotta jump over their laser and slice them. And that's probably the hardest thing in the game, is jumping over their laser. That's probably, um, actually the hardest combat-related challenge in the game. But they telegraph it really nicely, they make a grunt before they fire. So it's super easy to jump over their laser. If you ever fought more than one of them, it could be interesting, but usually you only fight one enemy at a time. I think I only remember seeing two enemies close to each other. These tiny guys run at you really fast, so it's best to use your laser pistol. Trying to use your sword is a good way to get hit because of the delay, the delay of swinging it. The pistol's just a better weapon overall, but like I said, there are some enemies that you need to use it for. Anyway, that's why, um, I said I would explain why the laser pistol had such a limited range. 
That's why they're trying to do a Spyro thing where you have two different kinds of melee attacks that work differently. But they couldn't think of a second melee attack, so they made a limited laser pistol like this. Which doesn't shoot very far. It's also ironically and probably unintentionally the thing that makes the most sense in universe. A friend pointed out to me that laser pistols that shoot forever don't make a lot of sense for safety reasons, like they're incredibly dangerous. But a laser pistol that shoots in a really limited cone, like like Jim's does here, that makes a lot more sense for safety reasons. And you know, you could adjust the setting on it. That actually makes a lot more sense. You can't adjust the setting on Jim's laser pistol here, but they accidentally did something kind of cool. Not in the game design, but um, you know. I also said I would talk about the platforming mechanic I haven't mentioned yet, which is sometimes you notice we pull out a glider. The gliders actually morph this pink blobby thing following us around. And he shouldn't be following us around right now because he doesn't belong to us, but um... I guess the developers didn't really care about that. Because Morph doesn't belong to Jim. But anyway, in order to use the Morph Glider at, while you're in the air, you have to press and hold Triangle. Which is really unintuitive to me, because in every other game with a gliding function, you just hold the jump button instead. Having to press Triangle is a little weird, especially since Triangle isn't used for anything else in the game except for talking to people. Like, triangle is the general interaction button, so it's kind of weird that it would be the glide button. We only got one more diode to put in the generator. So, um, I would have talked more about the combat, but it's really, really easy. The stuff I mentioned about jumping over the guys with pistols, that's the hardest thing in the combat, like I said. We're very near the end of the level, by the way, after we put this last diode in the generator. Then we'll have three, uh, three pirate treasures, which is what we wanted. There are two more in the level we could get by collecting four golden gems and six scrolls, but we don't want those because we don't need them. You did it! You saved us! Oh, now that the lift's working, we can all get out of the mine. As a token of our gratitude, please, take this. We found it hidden in the mine. It's my responsibility to operate this here lift system. Are you wanting to take a ride on the lift? Yes, yeah, sure, I'll use the lift. Now, um, of note, we can actually exit any of the levels at any time and go to the hub world. I'm sorry, hub selections. <laughs> We can go to the world map at any time, but there's also an exit to each level, and that's Do De Delbert. 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 So, Jim, have we finished our adventures in the sunny town of Benbo? So something Disney really, really pushed in the marketing for Treasure Planet was Jim's Solar Surfer. And it made sense in the film, because it was a way he vented his excess emotions. You know, his dad left him when he was little, and he had a lot of pent-up emotional stress. And he didn't know who he wanted to be, or, or anything like that. So he would go around and uh, do extreme solar surfing to vent his excess emotions and feel alive. Because cause it's implied that was how he, how he felt alive, was riding around on a solar surfer. But Disney really, 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 really wanted to advertise the solar surfer. So in both of the Treasure Planet games, it's a heavily used feature. There's um, three races in this game based around the solar surfer. And several Tony Hawk style sections in the PS2 Treasure Planet game based around the solar surfer. Which are a lot better than this. But this actually isn't all that bad, um... Contrary to what, what it may look like, the races are actually the best part of Treasure Planet on the PS1. They control really well, and um, when you later get different vehicles, they do actually handle differently in reasonable ways. 
you know, and they turn great. You don't need to um, manually drift or anything. They just have really nice handling by themselves. So, um, all of these race segments remind me of arcade racing games and stuff you'd play on, like, the Super Nintendo. Because the mechanics for it are incredibly simple. You know, you just turn left and right and jump. Oh, um, no, you also collect clocks. For some reason, even though it's already a race, instead of just giving you a normal timer, um, they give you an invisible timer, and also a visible timer. It's kind of weird. Um, let me explain. We have to clean the, clear the race in under 3 minutes and 30 seconds in order to get all three pirate treasures possible. But we don't see that timer. What we do see is that timer up in the upper right, and we collect clocks to make that timer go up, if we ever run out that timer on screen, then we have to restart the race. So in a way the race has two timers, it's just that you can't see one of them. And it seems kind of excessive, because it's already a race, the goal's already to get to the end as fast as possible. I don't think I'm... I don't think adding these clocks really does anything. In the second race, the clocks are, are more, um are more of a hindrance, because you got to slow down sometimes to get them or else you lose. But the second race also has a lot more lenient timing, and it's the only race where the clock placement is actually hard. In all the other races except for the second one, the, the clocks are placed in really obvious places where they're super easy to get. So, the design with the clocks, I'm not sure what they were going for there, but um... But it's here. The jumping, by the way, also feels pretty good. You don't jump really high, but you quickly get a feel for how far he goes, which is all you really need. So, um... Yeah, that's all six laps. Woohoo!